think of it as a separation of that interpersonal connection, right? But now we have them back on campus in thousands and there's no way to go, right? They can't just poof Harry Potter themselves away, right? You have to sit in that with them and have to navigate that. And I think that's that's just a really big thing that students and even us as professionals are having to relearn in engaging all of this with all of these layers and these topics that we're bringing up. Welcome to Student Affairs Now, the online learning community for student affairs educators. I am your host, Heather Shea. Today, we are celebrating our one-year anniversary of Student Affairs Now and featuring a panel of our listeners. Student Affairs Now is the premier podcast and learning community for thousands of us who work in, alongside, or adjacent to the field of higher education and student affairs. We hope you find these conversations make a contribution to the field and are restorative to the profession. We release new episodes every week on Wednesdays. Find us at studentaffairsnow.com, on YouTube, or anywhere you listen to podcasts. This episode is brought to you by Stylus. Visit styluspub.com and use the promo code SANOW for 30% off and free shipping. Today's episode is also sponsored by Anthology. Learn more about their innovative data-driven platforms to build and foster your campus student engagement experience. Learn more by visiting anthology.com slash engage. As I mentioned, I am your host, Heather Shea. My pronouns are she, her, and hers, and I am broadcasting from Okemos, Michigan, near the campus of Michigan State University, where I serve as the Director of Women's Student Services, and I'm also an affiliate faculty member in the MSU Student Affairs Administration Master's Program. MSU um, occupies the ancestral, traditional, and contemporary lands of the Anishinaabe, Three Fires Confederacy of Ojibwe, Ottawa, and Potawatomi peoples. The university resides on land ceded in the 1819 Treaty of Saginaw. So I'm going to open it up now to our panel. Thank you all of you for being here today, for joining me um, on this exciting one-year anniversary episode. Um, I want to begin by everybody <laughs> telling a little bit about who you are, what you do, what your current role is on your campus, um, and maybe a little bit about your pathway into or through student affairs. Um, and so we're going to start with Stefan. Welcome to uh, Student Affairs Now. Yeah, hi, Heather. <laughs> um, my name is Stefan Sans Ramirez. I go by he, him, his pronouns. I currently am an assistant professor of higher ed at the University at Buffalo in Western New York. And I actually got my master's in the program that Heather is currently a faculty member in. <laughs> so that's exciting. The Student Affairs Administration program at MSU. Go green. Go um, white. <laughs> I'm currently um, at the University at Buffalo, which operates on the unceded ancestral territory of the Seneca Nation of the Haneasane Sikh Nations Confederacy. I am grateful to respectfully work as a guest on these lands with the indigenous peoples who occupied this space before me and those who still call this place home. Um, a little bit about me and my journey through higher ed, student affairs, you know, after Michigan State University, I ended up being an assistant director of multicultural affairs and LGBT plus affairs at the university at uh, Texas and Arlington, so in the Dallas, Texas area, where I did a lot of social racial justice work. Um, while at Michigan State, I worked in residence life and migrant student services. It's kind of like a dual appointment during my time there. Um, and after pursuing and obtaining my PhD in ed policy, I became a full-time faculty member at the University at Buffalo. So um, administrative and then HESA kind of experience on the faculty side. So excited to be a part of this conversation with all, all of you awesome individuals. Thank you so much for saying yes to joining us today. Uh, welcome, Daisy. Thank you so much for having me. I'm also very excited to be a part of this community of listeners. Um, I fell in love with college. Um, my parents are immigrated from the Philippines. Um, they were very strict. And so for me, when I went to college, I felt very liberated because I finally had an opportunity to really learn more about who I am and never left college after I started. So um, I have worked at different universities throughout the United States. I've worked at Weber State University, um, Indiana University, New York University, Baruch College. Um, and most recently, I worked at Pima Community College in Tucson, Arizona for the past 14 years. And I'm really grateful for the opportunities that I've had to just learn more about 
our college student population, undergrad and graduate students. Um, I also have taught Asian American studies and I'm really grateful to be able to contribute to this conversation today. Thank you so much for being here. It's great. Aja, welcome. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Excited to be here. I'm Aja Holmes. My pronouns are she, her, and sis. And I am uh, currently at the University of San Francisco. And we are on the unceded lands of uh, the Ramatush only and also the Miwaka only tribes here. And we also acknowledge the painful history and genocide that forced the removal from these territories. And we celebrate uh, the public reserve that indigenous descendants who are working today to preserve and nourish those indigenous identity. So I'm excited to be with you all. I was, uh, before this, I was uh, at Sacramento State. So not that far from here. So just like little traffic hour and a half drive uh, just east of here. And so um, I am been here for three months and I work with the residential life and the off-campus student life and also the basic needs here. We tracked you down. Originally, your your email address bounced back to me and I'm like, where is she now? And, then <laughs> <I found you. laughs> and Brian, last but not least, my colleague at Michigan State. Welcome. Hello, friends. How are you all? Mm -hmm. um, my name is Brian Hercliffe Proffer. I use he, him, his pronouns. Um, currently, working at Michigan State University, as Heather just said, um, and Michigan State University occupies the ancestral, traditional, and contemporary lands of the Nishname, Three Fires Confederacy of Ojibwe, Ottawa, and Potawatomi peoples, and the university itself resides on land ceded uh, in the 1819 Treaty of Saginaw. Um, here at Michigan State, I work with all of our student organizations in the Office of Student Life um, in a quickly growing, fun little community that we have here. Um, my journey is I'm a Michigander through and through. So all of my institutions I've been at uh, have spread across the uh, private public sector, small and large, but they're all here in Michigan, uh, University of Michigan Flint, uh, Concordia University, Marygrove College, and then here currently at Michigan State University. So a little bit of everything. Uh, I like to sample a lot. Uh, and so, yes, that's, that's kind of my journey. So I love this panel because you all represent lots of different, not only geographical locations, but career paths and trajectories. And, and I also love that I have a little overlap with, with each of you in different ways. Um, so thank you so much for agreeing to be on the podcast today as we celebrate our one year anniversary. Um, so as we start off today, I, I would love to know just a little bit about how you relate to the podcast or how you found out about it. And if you were to recommend one episode for professional development, which would it be? Um, and I'm going to start with, with Daisy and then whoever else wants to jump in, just jump in after that. Um, I am really grateful to have close relationships with Keith. Keith actually served as my coach for a year and really helped me to be to think more critically about what is essential to me. I actually read a book about essentialism. And then also Glenn is someone that I consider a brother. Um, similar, similar to Aja and Heather, we all were a part of the Standing Committee for Multicultural Affairs. Um, mm -hmm. And then I became more involved with the Asian Pacific American Network and served as the chair and, and different roles. And so ACPA has a very special place in my heart. Um, so it's, it's just really great to have that, that community. Um, for me, one of the, there's actually two that really stand out, but one that I want to mention is identity conscious supervision and student affairs. I feel like the panelists were the authors of the book, Shruti, Craig, and Rob, mm -hmm. and it was a really important reminder to not lose sense of who we are, especially when we have a supervisor that might not acknowledge all of our identities. Um, you know, and I, I think about one of the stories that Rob shared about um, all of the racial strife and injustice that has happened, particularly during this pandemic. And he talked about um, how he can't breathe and how he's often asked to care for students, to put programs on for students. And, and he, it really struck me when he said, what about me? Like, who's looking out for me because I can't breathe. Um, and I, it was just such an important reminder that we, we need to see each other's humanity and see all of the different parts of our identity. 
Wow. I just had a chance to re-listen to that episode because we re-released it. It's actually our highest and it came out the first day, right? Um, it's the one that has received the most hits and it is that moment where he speaks about that is so incredibly powerful. Um, yeah, thank you so much for lifting that one up. And I believe Susanna, um, just did an amazing job of hosting that one too. Mm -hmm. Anyone else have thoughts? Yes, so I am uh, now at University of San Francisco, which is a Jesuit campus. And even though I've worked at a Jesuit campus before at Georgetown uh, University, before I went back and got my doctorate, I had been away from, you know, uh, a religious campus for a while and uh, listening to the religious, secular, spiritual identities on campus really helped me kind of get back into that mindset and frame what's it like to be at a campus where you are freely, you know, can, can, can express your religions and things that nature. I want to see also the privilege to be able to do that, right? Um, and to be able to, to talk about that. And I wanted to be able to get my mindset back in terms of being in a place where, you know, mass is a part of the welcoming, the convocation part of it and, and, and to be there. And so it was exciting to be able to, um, to do that and listen to that. And uh, also to, um, you know, get, 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 center myself back um, and being on a Jesuit campus. Thanks so much I for also too. That. I also did the uh, the identity conscious one as well um, because my super my supervision development is uh, my dissertation and so I also you know listen to that one one because it's a subject and I want to continue to you know uh, learn about it and, and continue to grow in that area so that was also a really good episode too but since Daisy already talked about it I wanted to talk about the other thing. <laughs> <laughs> else. You know, it's a it's a hard question to choose an episode because they're all amazing in their own ways, right? Oh, <laughs> um, yeah. But I, you know, so one one that I wanted to to lift up in this space since we have to choose one for the for mm -hmm. the point of the conversation, yeah. um, which is which also was hosted by uh, Dr. Susana Munoz, and it was uh, titled hashtag Undocu SA mm -hmm. Pros on Docu uh, Student Affairs Pro, Pros um, Voices, right? Laura and Alonzo were highlighted. Um, some scholar practitioners were highlighted in these conversations. And for me, um, as someone who works alongside a lot of undocumented and DACA college students, uh, this was important. I love the fact that there was an episode dedicated specifically to this topic um, and, you know, them sharing their wisdom and knowledge and personal experiences themselves in mixed status families or as DACA recipients and working alongside these communities, um, you know, something that, you know, that a lot of folks don't take into consideration administration too, is like some policies that are um, exclusionary to this community um, and some that are a little more inclusive, but specifically for those who are only DACA recipients, right? And I think mm -hmm. Alonzo and, and Laura and Dr. Um, Susana Munoz really brought to the forefront the conversation of like, we need to think through different ways to make sure all undocumented students are being supported within resources and supports services and not just those who have a specific designation, right? So this is one that I thought was super powerful and super important for us to continue um, to learn from and engage in our own works, right? Within our own sphere of influences. Yeah. Yeah. That episode had a incredible <laughs> mic drop moment where Alonzo is talking about applying for a doc program on his own campus mm -hmm. and then going back to his office and getting a phone call Right. And they're like, we just had a person we're talking, we need to find out about resources. <laughs> it was like, yeah. Whoa. Yeah. like that, that was intense. That was me. I didn't tell you that, but that was me. And that's unfortunate that no yeah. one knows how to yeah. talk through or support someone yeah. that holds yeah. this, this identity, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. That was powerful. Yeah. Brian, what would you share? You know, agree. There's so many episodes, either feeling the chills or feeling the feels. I think one that really sticks out is the Amplifying and PETA Voices. I think it came out at a very intentional time. Um, and probably my affiliation is very personal based, maybe not as professional driven, right? For that professional development, but more for, um, it was great to see a PETA's on a screen um, and to be able to just have a conversation about a PETA's and the experience. And that was really powerful to me to be able to see not only myself on screen, but also the topic that, that related to myself, right? And I think um, it was also learning. I think part of our journeys of learning our identities is you never know everything. And I learned, I, there was a lot of validation and there was a lot of learning that I did in that podcast as well. And 
just the people part of it, like Mindy and, and all that. They, I love them already. And it was just really <laughs> great to see them and hear them as well, especially at that time uh, of the pandemic and everything that was going on. And, and mm-hmm. the stuff that they said, I was like, yes, okay, mm-hmm. thank you. Thank you. So mm-hmm. yeah, that was really, really resonated with me. That was an incredibly powerful episode. I, and Glenn, I know was like, I don't know how I'm going to get into this conversation. Right. And like the emotional um, toll that that all takes. Right. But having that at that moment in time was such a powerful uh, opportunity and also labor on his behalf and, and all of those folks. So I think it ended up going in a different direction. It was actually planned before, um, you know, we knew it was such a relevant topic. So that's, that's one other interesting thing is sometimes our topics come about like as a result of something that's happened sometimes the entire episode shifts based on something that just happened and then we go in a slightly different direction um so i want to open up to kind of pressing issues facing your campuses because i mean you all are on different types of campuses different locations or you're working adjacent to higher ed i'm curious about um how, what are the issues currently facing students? Um, and whoever wants to answer is great, but we'll start with Aja. Mm-hmm. Yep. So a couple of things that I've noticed in terms of it, I'm speaking in a general sense, I've only been at USF for about um, three months now, but we know that I live in San Francisco, which is the most expensive, one of the most expensive cities in the nation, right? And so it's just the cost of housing, the cost of being able to live, I think is one of the things that are issued that's also facing our students. We don't have enough residence hall space on campus for all 10,000 students to live. So we have to prepare our students who are living, you know, in the residence halls who are going to move off to campus to be able to live in the community and live in a city that is very expensive. We want them to be safe. We want them to live in good and clean environment. But at the same time, you know, our students would pay, you know what, I can put up with living with 80,000 people in one room with $50 a month because I, I'm able to make it and I'm able to make ends meet, right? So that's, you know, one of the pressing issues that I've kind of been am hearing about and, and, and uh, within the area because of the fact that I live in this particular city. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I think the, the other one is also two food insecurities. And so in terms of bundling that together, that basic need, right? Uh, and so you have seen these food pantries pop up on college campuses. When I was an undergrad, there wasn't a food pantry, but I am sure that there were people who were food insecure, who were also housing insecure, who might've been living in couch, couch surfing as they call it, living on, uh, you know, in their cars and not having adequate, you know, access to food, you know, and so the food pantries have been popping up. And so one of the things that's underneath my, uh, in my portfolio now is working very closely with the food pantry. And we have, you know, I think the, the heart of people who are really coming out, who want to be able to help address this need and work very closely with our students to be able to do that. And it's been a joy to work with some of the surrounding farms uh, here and also some with faculty members who've infused, you know, helping out the food pantry as part of their service learning in their, in their living learning communities in their syllabus. And so that's been, you know, really interesting to kind of see that come about and work with that and and making sure that our students have access to you know healthy food and also at the same time produce so now in addition to the fact that we have this food pantry we have a farm and we have a we have working with a farm that's bringing us you know fresh produce so people can have the salads and the fresh vegetables and the roughage that is needed for there as well and now we're looking to secure more fruits and vegetables and so those are a couple of things that's really been for my past couple of weeks since I only been here a short period of time at USF that has really been at the forefront for me is, you know, uh, securing housing in, in, in a place that you can afford to live and also at the same time food and trying to get, you know, access to food. So those basic needs that, you know, we need that. We all have studied Maslow's hierarchy of needs and you know that those are two basic things you needed in order for you to even survive, for you to be thinking in class and be able to put, you know, uh, applying, you know, theory to practice, you know, in some of those. And so that's been something that's been uh, at the forefront for me these past couple of weeks. Yeah, and I know that COVID has certainly amplified all of those issues, mm-hmm. right? Like they existed before, but it's just added to that. Other other topics that are facing um, students on your campus or things that have been most pressing as um, we've returned, you know, to some level of in-person engagement um, that you'd like to bring up? I think I can share a little bit. I think Aja hit it on the, you know, on, on, on the mark with some of these pressing issues. Some 
you know, one thing that I really appreciate about Student Affairs Now is this bringing to the forefront um, important topics and conversations that may or may not be having on a lot of our campuses, right? Like such as what's happening with uh, policing, right? And BIPOC bodies and how that, you know, campus police and outside of campus police are affecting, traumatizing, or, um, you know, this perceived traumatic experience could happen around policing, right? Which you all um, did a really good job at bringing in a beautiful panel of folks to talk about this issue in particular with Black students. Um, you know, I think not just at my institution, I've worked at a variety of institutions and unfortunately it hasn't changed in regards to like BIPOC bodies still feeling that they are in spaces that are not meant for them, right? Um, you know, and, and, and I wish I can say, not I don't wish I can say, but it doesn't just happen in my experiences at predominantly white institutions that I've either attended as a student and or worked at. I've also worked at Hispanic serving institutions and BIPOC students still felt the same way there. So, right, so there's this big, bigger conversation that we need to continue having even in outside of predominantly white schools and historically white institutional spaces about how whiteness and white supremacist ideologies are still taking up so much space and power on our college campuses, right? I'm constantly working alongside black and brown students who come to me in confidence of like, this happened to me on my way to school. You know, on my way to class, I got pulled over by a cop and they had no reason to pull me over. So literally they went back to their car and drove away. They said they were gonna look me up in the system and they just drove away. And to me, that was a, a moment um, of, of realization that is because I wasn't white, right? And now I have to come to class and into this space with all of that on my mind and on my spirit, right? So now I have to think about driving home from class, right? So these are things that folks are constantly um, worried about and having to navigate on and off of our campuses, right? And I always talk about this notion of like campus climate, right? Which we also have to like mm -hmm. geographical climate, like the state climate, the federal, you know, the socio-political climate writ large and how all of that is impacting our students. And sometimes um, I don't think we hold enough space for them to participate in healing, right? And liberation, which Wrapping it back to Student Affairs Now, there is an episode um, hosted by Dr. Rochelle Pope with uh, Dr. Annalise Singh around this notion of space for BIPOC people to heal and find liberation to continue moving forward with um, inequalities, right? So I'll stop there, but that's just some of what I continuously have seen throughout the years, and it doesn't seem like it's simmering down anytime soon, unfortunately. Yeah. And Heather, I'll just add, um, because we have similar issues too at Pima Community College. Um, but one of the pressing issues in the state of Arizona is not really understanding what are all the COVID-19 regulations and policies. Mm -hmm. And even at our campus, there's confusion over, should I wear a mask? Shouldn't I wear a mask? Um, sometimes it's enforced by instructors and sometimes it's not enforced. And so there is a I think a, a lack of confidence and security in knowing that they're going to be safe on campus. And so that that's a concern. Um, and when you talk to different folks who work in student services or academic affairs, they give you different answers. So there's also a lack of consistency in what the messaging is. Um, and that causes additional anxiety in being back on campus. Um, and next week, the governor of Arizona is going to make a decision about what is going to be required and what is not. And he's leaning towards being very lenient about wearing masks and being vaccinated. Mm. My parents still live in Tucson. So we have a constant um, conversation about kind of what, uh, what the differences are, state politics. And I mean, you're exactly right. Those national and, and state contexts are, are affecting how our students are engaging, you know, in the higher ed. And, and it's something, it seems outside of our control, but that doesn't mean that on a daily basis, we're not having to kind of um, act or react as a, res as a result. Um, well, and, and I think all of that leads right to food insecurities and mm. the racial tensions and COVID-19 and all these restrictions. There's such an anxiety in our students, right? Mm. They are worried. Um, yeah. And they're also having to relearn how to engage in all these conversations and these situations in person, right? Engaging in these situations yeah. and the conversations as we've learned is very different in the 2D virtual world, right? 
we're in the comfort of our home or with family members or mm -hmm. with people who normally traditionally we feel safe. Um, and, you know, we can turn off the screen a little bit quicker. We can think of it as a separation of that interpersonal connection, right? But now we have them back on campus in thousands and there's no way to go, right? They can't just poof Harry Potter themselves away, right? You have to sit in that with them and have to navigate that. And I think that's that's just a really big thing that students and even us as professionals are having to relearn in engaging in all of this with all of these layers and these topics that we're bringing up, so. That is such, that is so absolutely true. And I, I am a parent to two teenagers and um, my older kid and I were having this conversation last night because they are just exhausted. And I think the big piece of it is that they had been used to moving from thing to thing to thing to thing um, before the pandemic. And then their entire way of interacting and engaging in classroom spaces just completely changed. And now it's like going back feels like relearning mm -hmm. how to be a, a high school student again, right? Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I think, I think mental health. And so I'm thinking about, um, mm -hmm. you know, the conversations that we're having around our proverbial water coolers. And I know the water cooler metaphor doesn't necessarily hold up um, <laughs> in the Zoom age, right? But and it's also a little bit weird that we don't have those like before the meeting or after the meeting conversations really in the same kind of ways, um, which mm -hmm. has also created some disconnect in our collegial relationships. But Brian, I'm curious if you have some things, I know student life, cause I used to occupy that, that um, suite of offices has a water cooler. Can't imagine standing <laughs> around it talking about things, but what are the things that you're talking about with your colleagues? And I'd love to hear other folks um, chime in on this too. Issues facing students, things you're talking about with colleagues. Yeah, um, interesting enough, I think the water cooler is right outside the office where I am in, you know, your old space <laughs> here is the new water cooler space for us. Oh. Um, <laughs> you know, there's a little bit more room, but I think, you know, we're, we're definitely talking about the mental health, right? We, there's, mm -hmm. there's some concern about how our students are holding everything, you know, our, our CAP service counseling and psychiatric services are at an all-time high usage, right? Um, also with our employees uh, and staff and faculty usage of those resources. So mental health is something we are touching base almost on a daily basis uh, where what's going on, resources are being pushed out to our students um, in full community. Um, and I think our other water cooler is um, there was an episode, and I can't remember which one, because um, I rewatched half of them in the past couple of days to remember what they were all about. <laughs> but there was one where someone was saying that student affairs is mission critical. Like we've learned and the institutions have mm -hmm. learned that student affairs and the work we do is mission critical. And I really appreciated that. And when, when that person said that, and that's what I was, I like stood up and I was like snapping saying yes. Um, but I think we're talking here is what does that mean? at Michigan State and how do we restructure to recognize that collaborative and key piece of the student experience. Um, we're going through some structural changes and so that's really on the forefront is how do we lift up the work that we do, not to overshadow anything else, but to integrate it and weave it in so that it is a full on Michigan State experience of your, of your college journey. And we've got you from your academics to your extracurriculars, to your uh, food and housing, to your full experience as a human being here at Michigan State. But how do we do that? How does that appear in a institutional structure, especially at Michigan State? We a large institution, right? 50,000 mm -hmm. students plus, um, wide reach. Um, so how, what does that look like? And so that's really on our forefront as well, especially post pandemic when we're getting in some ways some cred in, in the validity of what we do and how key of a role it is and how it affects even student health when they're interacting with their academics. So we're, we're kind of chatting about some of those things. People are like, I know what they do. Now that, now that this all has happened, right? It's like, I need to call the Dean of Students Office. <laughs> Yeah, Aja, I knew you were going to jump in. What, you, what were you going to add? I, I um, one of the things is also to the mental health part, and so I'm glad that Brian kind of brought that up and talked about that. And that was one of the episodes that Rachel was hosting there about mental health and college students, and that was one of the episodes that I actually had my staff listen to because 
you know, we needed to know how do we work with students? You know, we do, we know we always have a counseling and psychiatric services on campus. We know we have a CAPS office on campus, you know, but what happens in those after hours? What happens, you know, when those mental health um, things happen to where we get calls from parents that says, I haven't talked to my child in X amount of days. And, you know, I, I'm flying in because I haven't seen them or haven't talked to them in this long. And, you know, and, and at USF, many of our students are from all over the country and all over the world. And so we have to be able to provide some of those mental health services and also be able to get to that in the in-between stages, right? Between going to see CAPS and, you know, those nighttime, you know, students don't have crisis between nine and five. They have crisis 24 hours, seven days a week. And so how do we make sure of that? And so that's one of the things that we're definitely working very closely here with um, our CAPS offices and also to our Dean of Students office to be able to make sure of that. We've had, you know, folks that maybe have some really not great relationships with family and they're coming here to, to you know sometimes to get away from that and 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 start anew because college is, is, a, is a new refreshing time for them to 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 transition to do a lot of different things and we have to be able to provide those spaces and so some of those things that we're talking about you know um, amongst uh, our staff members is looking at how do we provide that support for our for our students from a mental health perspective how do we also provide that support for students who are coming and using college as an opportunity to you know be the person that they know that they want to be for so long and transition and part of that might be transitioning and so how do we have spaces for that did our gender inclusive housing support them to be able to you know, to do that, you know, and on, and on top of this, do they still feel safe to come here and do that with this Catholic Jesuit mission, right? And one of the things that we pride ourselves on here is that being an open and inclusive place for everybody, you know, even though we know that our, you know, our mission and our values are, are you know, are rooted into there, we are, Cura personalities care for the whole person. And that's every aspect of that. And that's one of the things that I think the Jesuits do very well at in being able to really garner and provide that support and undergird for that support for whatever that student is going through, no matter what and how, what they're going through, you know, might conflict with some of the other things that we're, we're part of with that Catholic Jesuit institution and identity. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for thank you for bringing that up as well. And I think I think it's really fascinating how our campuses have had to adapt um, post COVID, right? And so I'm curious um, to to just kind of switch the topic just a little bit. Then um, you all are here today talking as listeners, but if you could be on a topic that's not about our one year anniversary, what what episode would you like to be on? Um, or what topic would you like to host the conversation on? Um, and Stefan, I'm going to show, I'm going to throw this to you first. Ah, uh, you know, I, I I again I can't just pick one thing, yeah. <laughs> but you know, um, I I would say something that I, I in addition to like anything re regarding like like the next students, uh, sense of belonging, resources and support for BIPOC bodies. Um, I, I see the importance of mentorship um, mm. for students at all levels, undergrad, master's, doctor level, um, and maybe a, around the conversation where how to build mentors, maybe some good mentoring practices, um, and then maybe bringing in those voices of like students and their actual mentors to kind of have a dialogue mm. together about how that their relationship work, you know, and what are both parties or multiple parties getting out of that relationship? And maybe even how can folks reach out to others um, for mentorship, right? Sometimes it comes, uh, you know, authentically, sometimes it's through an actual formal program that the institution is offering or a program is offering. But a lot of times, you know, if you're not a part of those circles or got an invitation or, you know, that's just not in you intrinsically to go out and take that initiative, like how can other folks be able to um, comfortably find opportunities mm -hmm. for mentoring relationships and how to go about that process? So I love the topic of mentoring um, and advising. So I think mm -hmm. that will be something I would love to see and be a part of. <laughs> I love that topic. I'm going to, I'm going to volunteer to host that episode or work with you on that. Cause I think that sounds like something. Um, and I think there's also a little bit of, um, you know, stigma or, or nuance around it, right? It's like, uh, how do you get a mentor and yeah. we can provide a little bit of that secret decoder ring, uh, so that 
you know, and, and I think it's, that's wrapped up in some of the conversations we've already been having around whiteness and the, the replication of the ways that those systems kind of create, um, create challenges for navigation. And so mentoring can be one of those tools that we can work, use to work um, sure. against that. So I love it. I love it. Uh, Daisy, what about you? If you could be on an episode or host a topic, what would it be? Yeah, I, I just want to give props to that too. I think mentoring is so underutilized and mm -hmm. so many people want to give back and mentor others. So um, so for me, if I could be on an episode, I would want to do something on solidarity building across communities. I don't think that we do that well enough. Um, and it is Latino Heritage Month. And I'm uh, actually doing a presentation at Pima called One Agenda, Two Communities Unite. And it's about the farm workers movement and living in Tucson, Cesar Chavez and mm -hmm. Dolores Huerta are spoken about a lot and um, rightfully so, but but we forget about the Filipino American farm workers and Larry Itliong and Philip Veracruz. So, so this presentation is gonna be about these two communities coming together and fighting for farm workers. And I just feel like we need to do that more in student <laughs> affairs and higher education. We need to be better examples. And, and I think for me, that's why CMA is such a special place for me because I saw that in action within ACPA and um, mm -hmm. and I love it whenever I see any members of the CMA family. So, I mean, it's been a long, long journey. So, um, so uh, that's what I would do. Solidarity building across communities. Mm -hmm. That's great. That's great. I love that episode too. I, I would, might have to uh, <laughs> thumb wrestle my, my fellow hosts on that one. Cause they would be like, we want to all talk about that. That's great. <laughs> Anyone else have ideas that they're like, this is what I want to talk about, Aja? So, you know, I think the Chronicle put out an article talked about this great resignation that's happening mm. and folks who are leaving, you know, the field or leaving their jobs, you know, and how the pandemic has really shifted folks' thought process and they're also have shifted their values and maybe even highlighted areas where they weren't even uh, utilizing, you know, or, or weren't doing the best they could for themselves, you know, and self-care was highlighted in everywhere. And I, I would love to do, you know, um, a podcast on how lack of supervision or bad supervision or un uh, uh, or not you know the great supervision really maybe aided in some of that you know there uh, one of the things that you know we know people leave. Uh, I guess before this, people say they leave bad supervisors, you know, because of the fact that, you know, uh, that that supervision, that leadership is not there or supervisors say, oh, I'm not a micromanager when really you are a micromanager and you don't know that because you, you know, have your own insecurities in terms of that, that's showing up in your work, showing up in how you're supervising others. And so I really think that that's something that is, you know, there. Many of our student affairs preparation programs you know, uh, um, it, and from what I say, can still do a better job on teaching folks how to be, you know, supervisors. You know, not everybody has that assistantship in housing and residence life to be able to practice that. And I and I think that there are some ways for us to look at how supervision might aid or might, you know, it is affecting how folks are leaving positions or leaving jobs because of that. And so I know you all had did a, you know, uh, a session on inclusive supervision, you know, which was, you know, great. Um, definitely accompanying the book that came out too. But, you know, some people really need to get off their chest or talk about the horrible supervision that they've experienced, you know, because yeah. a lot of folks who supervise, who've been in supervision positions for a while, who are leaders, you know, executive directors or the VPSAs and, and, and who are still supervising folks have not gone back to get to train or has not gone no. back to continue that training. A lot of these people have just been supervising, just flying by the seat of their pants. You know, we promote those up until their own ability to where they, you know, can't be promoted anymore. Right. And so there's, there's a point to where, you know, we, we continue to, to, to push people up and, and move them ahead, but not realizing that that supervision part um, is really lacking. And that's, what's causing people to move, leave positions and leave jobs and feel unsupported, you know, no, no, a, a paycheck isn't enough. A paycheck is not enough for folks to just be able to say, you got, you got a job, you're still getting paid, you should be okay. We have got to look at how morale and how that supervision or horrible supervision leads and how that uh, that morale is gone from that student or gone from that professional staff member and they're leaving the field. And people yeah. have realized this because we were all panicking during this pandemic and didn't know that. And when we said, oh, we're shutting down, what does that mean? 
housing and residence life was rocked to the core during this pandemic. Mm-hmm. We have been on top for so long. We have always had the money because we always got people living in the residence halls. But we know that we were shocked to the rock to the core with this mm-hmm. pandemic when they said we are shutting this down and everything's moving online. There's no reason for folks to live in our residence halls if I can take my classes from a Zoom from my own bedroom, right? Mm-hmm. So that was something that really rocked it in its hair. And there were some decisions that were made in the best interest of the university, never in the best interest of the staff member, when you laying mm-hmm. off people left and right, you know, because of that and, and, and not making the decision to, you know, how can we repurpose these folks? How can the fact that we know we have a hiring freeze, but some of these residents like folks who are really generalists, you know, jack of all trades, yes, we are. We can move them <laughs> from other areas and repurpose them other areas. But this great resignation has let us know that some of our leadership and some of our folks who are leading in these areas need to go back and figure out how you can be a best supervisor for others who are in there. They how to be that. Supervision, leadership, and management are not interchangeable. You do those things separately. And so that's probably like maybe 15 different topics, Heather, that I just kind of <laughs> gave you. <laughs> I love it. But I, love I it. just read this article and discussed it with my leadership team. And, and you know, and I work in housing and residence life. And so we have, we are sometimes at the core of some of that, but there's some things there that we have that folks don't want to, you know, admit that you've been in the field for 30 years, but yet your supervision is horrible. Yeah. And we need to yeah. call those people out. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's demoralizing. I mean, yes. it is demoralizing. Yeah. You're getting snaps from Stefan too. Stefan, do you yes. have something else all, you wanted to for, add? For yeah. All 18 ideas. Uh, yeah. Yeah. All 18 ideas. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have to say, so I have the pleasure of getting to teach EAD 893, if you remember, the ProDiva seminar, um, which allows me to have... Um, time with the students all four semesters of the ma- of the master's program and we're we picked up the book um creating sustainable careers in student affairs after i watched that episode and of course chris wren is writes the forward so um you know after you after you read her forward you're like oh my gosh i have to do something with this book in class but um i i really think that we're we're on the precipice of either a complete professional um revision i mean this 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 field, in order for us to want to continue to stay, has to start I be treating us better, right? But also, I think the systems around this field on our campuses have to start acknowledging. And I liked how, um, you know, Brian mentioned earlier the whole mission critical piece because I do think mm-hmm. it's brought to the forefront how valuable student affairs is. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. all right. So I'm gonna I'm gonna um, move to a lightning round. <laughs> I, I, I was, uh, I thought this would be a fun thing to kind of do to get a whole bunch of other um, kind of topics out into the idea universe. Um, and part of what I think about the lightning round is like just really quickly responding, right? So um, we're going to do two warm up questions, which are not related to episodes or not related um, to the, to the podcast. And then we're going to move, well, Kind of, I guess they sort of somewhat are. Um, but anyway, then we're going to move to like specifically naming episodes. So um, we've got a prescribed order, lightning round, one word or two word answers or the topic um, itself. And so first question is, do you watch Student Affairs now on YouTube or do you listen on iTunes? Stefan. YouTube. YouTube. Daisy. YouTube. Aja. Podcast. Ryan. YouTube. Okay. The next time I'm not going to say your names. You're just going to follow in that same order. Okay. All right. I got, we got it this time. Okay. Um, and I, I asked this question only because like I said, iTunes, right? So you're not going to listen on iTunes if you have an Android. So we'll, we'll go through who has iPhones and Android. So iPhone or Android, Stefan. iPhone. 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 <laughs> iPhone. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so my partner out there who's listening to this probably on his Google Pixel can can uh, roll his eyes right now. Um, okay, so now we're going to get into the emotional and the practical, right? So like, what are the episodes that have had an emotional connection for you or had some practical implications? So um, what is the episode during which you laughed or your favorite fun episode? Stefan. I don't have a favorite fun episode, but I will say that one of my favorite episodes is the Why They Hate Us by uh, Dr. Susana Munoz and Dr. Lindsay perez Heber. <laughs> so good. Um, I'm going to say the side hustle phenomenon. Okay. Awesome. I, I was going to say that one too as well, because you know, as someone who's trying to find a side hustle. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. 
I loved the geeking out one, one of the first episodes that came out, but it was just nice to be like, hey, fellow people. I love it. That was great. That was great. Okay. What episode made you think, Stefan? I think um, all of them do, but racial healing and liberation on uh, campus, um, which was highlighting uh, Dr. Annalise Singh, made me really think about healing and liberation to continue doing some good racial and social justice work. Um, I'm going to say workplace, culture, humanity, and innovation. Um, one of the speakers talked about the giving tree and to think really critically about that book. Ah, oh, Chris Conton, that was such a, a powerful quote. Yeah. I just I, I to say the uh, foster care, the, the, the foster care one. And I think that's such a forgotten population that we forget. You know, we think that everybody, okay, once you're 18, you'll be okay. But these folks, you know, really when you've been in foster care for so long, especially if you are black and brown and you've been in there for so long that you, and, and to age out of foster care system on a college campus, there's more resources and then college campus needs to step up to provide those resources. So I appreciate it. Uh, learning a little bit more uh, about, about that. Thank you. Yeah. Brian. Yeah, the post-COVID conversation uh, really got me thinking of everything. There was some validation. There were some questions. There was some yes, some stuff to do now um, that I, I've been thinking about ever since I listened to it. Cool. Episode that you learned something you didn't already know. <laughs> Stefan. Sure. Um, in the supporting college students in recovery, episode. Um, I didn't know that less than 5% of institutions actually have programs catered to students in recovery, right, which is an issue um, that I don't think we talk about much. So that's something that I, that's a statistic that I was able to learn and kind of reflect on and see how I can um, work towards helping in that initiative within my sphere of influence. Thank you. Yeah. Daisy? Um, something that I found really interesting is I actually watched the looking, um, looking back, looking forward, and I really enjoyed mm -hmm. hearing from the four different hosts. And for me, something that I learned is the curious question. And I think that's a really good way to begin thinking about maybe a program or a need or, or how, you know, what needs to be addressed um, on your campus. So I really like the curious question. <laughs> Um, I would say that the veterans. And so as we know that within our political sense that we have evacuated certain areas of the world where we've been in for era, for era, forever. And so now we have veterans who are now returning back to our campuses or returning to our campuses to the, continue their study to pick up where they left off, you know? And so how do we support those folks? In a, and in addition to how do we latch on to the mental health part of that? You know, when you have the veteran and you have the one who had this PTSD and how do we utilize that? And so that was a really good episode to be able to learn a little bit more about veterans affairs and how veterans offices were popping up on college campuses. And now that we have many folks who are coming back from that, how do we support those folks? Awesome. Um, I mean, I could cheat and just say all of them because I learned from every episode, <laughs> but I think one that's a little bit more tangible would be the assessing student learning. Um, you know, little dabbling, little hey assessment, but nothing like that intentional mapping and envisioning mm -hmm. what it can be, especially in the realm of student organizations or student development or and, and all of that world. Um, that I, I learned a lot. I, the notes I have are plentiful. Well, okay. Episode, I don't know who wrote these lightning round questions. Probably <laughs> me. But okay. <laughs> the, the last one that's not like a quick answer, but this one, episode with the most applicable takeaways to your current role in student affairs or adjacent work. Um, Stefan. Again, all of them, but I would <laughs> say because a lot of my scholarship centers the experience and policy effects of undocumented folk, um, the undocu essay prose voices episode um, really helps me think through different ways to see my scholarship, to kind of promote um, this work with others of how to build inclusive um, communities and, and policies and resources for these communities. Um, and it also allows, it, I use part of that episode in one of my classes because I teach a class on race, racism and undocumented collegians in higher ed. Um, so it's really been applicable for me in my own work and hopefully for my students as well. <laughs> Daisy? You know, I want to say like all of the sessions that I watched, one, one similar thread that stood out is just humanity and just reminding ourselves to honor folks as humanity. And, and one session that, that comes to mind is in workplace culture, humanity and innovation. David shared a story about how one of his 
um, staff members asked to take time off because of family death. And, mm -hmm. um, and she, she apologized. She said, I'm sorry that I, I can't be at work. I have to go to this funeral. And David said, don't apologize, take care of what you need to. And, and it's sad to me that that individual has worked in higher ed. And this is the first time she has a supervisor who's saying it's okay, go take care of yourself, go be with family. Mm -hmm. That's important. And so so for me, that's a reminder is how do I treat people? How do I want to be treated? And do we hold people accountable when they aren't behaving right and not yeah. treating us and recognizing our humanity? Um, yeah. I'm going to say, well, there's, there's maybe three. So the, the transitions one, the Lightning transition round, part Aja. one. Lightning <laughs> round. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> transitions part one and two because as I just transitioned from an, yeah. from an institution to the other one and then the other one I, I'll keep it at two was the uh, hearing from the conversation with the ACPA NASPA leaders and so uh, that was you know as someone who's on the governing board for ACPA it was really good to hear from that leadership in terms of how those organizations uh, you know create and also support what we're doing here uh, in the field yeah yes 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 Brian um, I hadn't thought about the ACPA present one, but dang, okay, that was a good one too. Yes, um, I think that that workplace culture humanity innovation one was just yeah. the one that I took a lot with. I'm a new supervisor, so I am trying to soak up all the information on how to unlearn and not do what I've struggled with with previous supervisors, right? Um, and so that one just had a lot of nuggets to help even frame what this means to build a team, to build a culture of care with, with individuals you supervise or even colleagues you supervise with together or something. Uh, it's a new realm, so it was really helpful for me to kind of just get some wisdom um, and some, some framing as I enter into this world, so. I love it. That's great. So this was a suggested um, question at the very end. So thank you, Daisy, for suggesting this. Um, and, and I think what the companion episode to today's episode is us as hosts kind of talking a little bit about um, where we've been, where we're going, and then how we benefited. So I, I know for us, like this is truly a labor of love. Um, you know, the connection that we form with our panelists, as well as mm -hmm. um, with our listeners, has just been a phenomenal um, joy to be added to our lives, right? In a year where like we needed that. Um, so I would love to hear like in, in a word or a few words, Aja, um, <laughs> how have you benefited from the, from the podcast? Definitely. We're talkers. We're, ta we're listeners you. and I talkers, Heather. Talk. We're listeners and talkers. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would say that I've benefited. It's, it's so insightful, right? So many different topics. It's so insightful, um, but also it's a, it's a lot. It's a lot. It, it has allowed me to get free professional development. Um, mm. You, you know, being this lifelong learner that I am. So thank you for for the great work that you and the rest of your team does for this, Heather. Thank you, thank you, Daisy. Yeah, so I'm going to say um, I really appreciate how relevant all of the topics have been and how timely. Um, so for me, it's really been an opportunity to connect with folks through Zoom, even though, you know, I'm watching it. But that I love that, like it has been free professional development and the community has just been what I needed. So thank you all for doing this. Mm -hmm. So I, I was to say also too, utilizing it in my staff meetings to be able to have them listen to it and then bring it back and say, hey, what do we think about this? What are some things we learned? And, you know, and, and having some discussion and questions around some of the episodes that we've had and utilizing some of these episodes to also supplement training uh, during times, you know, for our training to, to, to do that. So we're going to have, you know, meet with CAPS and then utilize the mental health uh, in our college students episode to kind of also bring a little bit of that theory to practice, putting that into play in terms of, you know, uh, what's happening with our students. And so that's how I've used Student Affairs now. Awesome. Thanks. Brian? You, you know, the number of times I've been with a graduate assistant or a practice student and they'll say something like, Ooh, wait, there's a podcast. I just listened to it. <laughs> Let me go figure out which one it was. Uh, that's been a huge thing. I think um, it's also been very validating and relatable. I think seeing peers, you know, talking about the same issues I'm, I'm struggling with or validating the work that we do as a field, that we are a field, that we have value in higher ed. Um, as individuals listening to a lot of the identity conversations that have 
been happening on the podcast. Mm-hmm. I think being having it visible and spoken of and about is is something that has been needed in for a very long time. And so I really appreciated that that you haven't been afraid to to go there and and mm-hmm. to kind of start breaching those conversations that we really need to have in the field as as professionals and as human beings with each other. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I I just value that just so much. Yeah, I feel it's always a little bit self-promoting when I'm like sitting in a class or staff meeting like student affairs now, like there's something relevant there, but, but I do really feel like this field is evolving, right? So part of the mm-hmm. now concept is like, okay, what's next? What's next? Um, so we're going to wrap up final thoughts. I, I can't tell you how much I've enjoyed um, this conversation today. It was, it's been a really challenging week and this is so totally what I needed. Um, so final thoughts, anything else that you'd like to share at the end, Brian, I'm going to, we're going to do opposite order this time. So Brian. Um, <laughs> so much is going through my head right now. I think, um, being able to have the resources like this is hugely beneficial. Um, accessible and something quick and easy that I have to use for myself, but also um, because we work with so many students, graduate assistants, students and fellow professionals. um, And just the topics just have me thinking every single day. So I'm just in a cloud of thought all the time, thinking of what could be, what is, where, how to get there. Um, So yes. Just kind of final thoughts, random, not really like together, but they're there. <laughs> Thanks so much. Aja. I think utilizing the podcast, you know, with my staff and introducing them to this particular, uh, you know, platform, it's also accessible. Like you said, you can you watch it on YouTube or you can also listen to it, you know, on iTunes. So I appreciate that. And I also appreciated how you had other podcasts or things that were also student affairs related to as well, right? Like what else? A is podcast going on? Like jamboree. The, yes, this podcast. Yeah. Yeah, like, <laughs> scholar tea and the meeting after the meeting and stuff like that and had those folks on to talk about that because there's room for everyone to be able to have something like this to be able to talk about this and I'm happy that the pandemic is something or even before that you know student affairs like we can do this it doesn't have to be about some other topic student affairs can get into the podcast industry so I appreciate that yeah that podcast jamboree was it was amazing. It just came out. The episode just came out. So if you mm-hmm. haven't listened to it yet, you should totally do it. But I love that Keith um, brought together 12 different podcasts to share. And yeah. there's going to be a part two because there were some people who couldn't make it. So yeah. awesome. Sorry, I'm interrupting final thoughts. Daisy. <laughs> <laughs> I want to say that it has been really refreshing to be a part of a student affairs community that welcomes community college professionals. Because even if mm. community college wasn't a part of the title, every session was relevant. And I was able to connect it to the work that I do because working in a community college setting, we don't have the same student affairs culture and community that exists in universities. And so so thank you um, for being inclusive. I'm not surprised that y'all were inclusive um, and didn't have to mention community colleges and we were still welcome. So, so yeah. thank you, Heather. Please like share that with your crew because that's really important because I have felt invisible sometimes attending Mm -hmm. um, higher ed professional development places Mm -hmm. and community college folks are just invisible and left out. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, indeed. And that is that is definitely a part of the larger conversation. So when we think about panelists, we're always kind of thinking about like, how do we how do we think about not just uh, like our social identities, but also our professional identities and roles and types of campuses too. Thanks for naming that. Stefan, you're, you're closing us out on final All thoughts right. today. Well, let's hope it's a go on a good, on a good note. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I echo all of my peers and colleagues on this call sentiments regarding Student Affairs Now. It has been a true blessing to have this in my tool belt to, uh, learn from myself as a lifelong learner, but also to promote it to various colleagues and my students that I get to the privilege to work and learn alongside. Um, I think what I would love to see moving forward um, mm-hmm. is to elevate more of the student voices in this space, right? I think a lot Thank of the you. topics, mm-hmm. a lot of the topics are about students, right? And it's great that we get to work alongside students, but we can't always talk on behalf of students. Mm-hmm. And I would love to see some panelists and maybe even some student hosts 
um, on some of the really, really important topics just to um, elevate their voices and their experiences as well. Yes. But, Yes, 100% agree. Um, and so if you have suggestions of students who we should include, I Always. think you're going to be seeing more of that because we definitely- Always. hit me up, hit that. me up, Heather. I love it, I love it. I would, I would say we That's can start awesome. with the residence hall associations. You know, yeah. that might be one way to do that in our, right, in our, yeah. uh, in our hall associations. And so that might be a, a good way for us to kind of start with the students and looking at that and then rolling into maybe the student governments and stuff. For sure. Yeah. Yeah, if you um, if you listen to the policing episode, a jail crendy, mm -hmm. you know, student body, pro oh my mm -hmm. goodness, like mm -hmm. brilliant, phenomenal. Yeah. I learned so much from her, and I learned, you know, I think that ultimately at the end of the day, my final word is that like this is about students, right? This is about serving students. It's about us getting what we need professionally, so we can do our work in wholeness and in truth um, with our students. So. I absolutely agree. And I think that's one thing that um, we will continue to talk about as hosts. Uh, I love the final thoughts. And so thank you all so much for contributing to today's episode, um, for your time and your energy and for investing in us. Um, for those of you who are watching, who do listen and use this in professional development, or you're, perhaps you're a faculty member, if you send us an email at host at studentaffairsnow.com, we will send you stickers. So we have some like fancy swag for our <laughs> one year anniversary um, that we'd be happy to um, pass along and share and mug. Yep, we've got some, some <laughs> Student Affairs Now mugs, yay. <laughs> so thank you all. Um, again, heartfelt appreciation to our colleague and friend, Nat Ambrosi, who does all of our behind the scenes production. She'll cut and paste and do all these fancy things for us. So thank you, Nat. Um, if you are listening today and you're not already receiving our weekly newsletter, mm -hmm. you can visit our website and scroll to the bottom or you like, I think there's a pop-up now um, and you can add your email to our MailChimp list. Um, our archives are growing. I think we're over 60 episodes now. And if you did find this conversation useful, please share it um, on social. That really helps us keep this conversation going and building our learning community. Um, final uh, shout out to our sponsors today. Uh, we are so appreciative of your support. Uh, so a little bit about them. This episode was sponsored by Anthology. Transform your student experience and advance co-curricular learning with Anthology Engage. With this technology platform, you are able to easily manage student organizations, efficiently plan events, and truly understand student involvement to continuously improve your engagement efforts at your institution. Learn more by visiting anthology.com engage. And I'll say to Brian knows this platform very, very well. That's his, that's his world. So um, well. Yes. <laughs> um, Stylus is proud also to be a sponsor of the Student Affairs Now podcast. Browse their student affairs, diversity and professional development titles at styluspub.com. Use the promo code SA now for 30% off all books plus free shipping, which is amazing. You can also find Stylus on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, LinkedIn, Twitter, at Stylus Pub. So please take the time to visit our sponsors, learn more about their amazing offerings. Again, I'm Heather Shea. Thank you to all of our listeners. Um, in addition to the five of you who have contributed so much to the podcast over the past year, um, everybody who's listening and watching today, please be well, drink your water, and uh, take care of yourselves. <laughs>